more than political participation. They used to need actually to be more in the boardrooms because a lot of things which change people's lives happen in the boardrooms. But those boardrooms, you find very few youth. As Jacob has told you, between 18 and 30, how many uh, younger people sit in the boardrooms to take decisions, to design uh, programs and policies which are going to affect uh, their lives. They are very, very few. So uh, beyond the economy, I think we need not just to listen to the youth, but to actually hear them. Hear them and include them, first and foremost, by training them, by uh, 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 skilling them, by mentoring them in leadership skills. Because now in Uganda we have self-selected -select, self kind of younger people who come up and say, I'm young and I can lead. The only qualification they have is young, being young. But you know, you're going to move on and, uh, and grow up. And which type of leadership are you offering? at that age is so critical. And uh, it's not a Ugandan problem, it's an African problem. Now, when you turn to the economy, Ugandan economy is also structured in such a way that uh, it's not an economy which is fit for, for the youth. Because it is still predominantly agrarian, and the younger people love to work in a clean environment in a, a cool environment. The, 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 white, environment. the white collar kind of jobs? Mm -hmm. They may not really be white collar. Actually young people get bored with white collar jobs. Mm. They want to do things which challenge them uh, to be innovative, to think and to create new value. Mm. And in that uh, we need to develop an economy which can we, provide such an environment and, and, and I'm so glad that for example uh, um, when I was invited by the current president I've been writing about some of these things over years and also talking them on these televisions and the newspapers and so on. He told me I want your ideas. I, I, I want to integrate them in my manifesto and the, I, I told him I can only do that, sir, if you allow me to define what the core of the manifesto should be. And he said, that's, that's all right. And that's what exactly I want. I don't want politics. I want now uh, to create value of younger people, out of younger people. And when you look at that manifesto of, of the National Resistance Movement now, of which I participated, 66% of it, that is two-thirds of it, is about jobs and wealth creation. Mm -hmm. And for that, squarely on how the youth can be integrated in the economy to play an active role in that. So for that, I think the areas we, we concentrated on were on skilling, the skilling programs, uh, to be now uh, rolled out in such a way that they are not <coughs> necessarily again an extension of teaching younger people boring things <laughs> like people who are skilling themselves they need the skills first to be skilled by but by integrating them in a, in a way that you first of all create an environment which can give them practical skills that's that means what you need to develop a very well coordinated cottage industry program because when you don't have cottage industry, you can't skill people when they don't have where they can learn practical skills. Uh, this tendency of putting them in a room to teach them on how computers work by just having the two computers that they are crowded around those cannot, cannot really bring the results. It will bring more heartwarming kind of stories instead of results. So in that manifesto we said, they are going to be a, a skilling program, and this time practical, put across the country uh, what we call industrial hubs. And in each of these industrial hubs, there are 12 skill sets which are going to be given to the younger people. Uh, find the cottage industries themselves, 
put up more factories around the country to create productive jobs because let me tell you uh, like Gloria was telling you if you are to choose which area you want to go to in order as a younger person to develop your uh, career the, f the, the finest area to train younger people is a factory line most of those countries you have seen which have uh, created leaders in all sorts of lives they are they, they, they just created the factory jobs first and foremost because factory teaches you discipline time management it is quality assurance and so on and so forth all those things which you would want any human being to have if you are not in a certain place at a certain point in time in, or, 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 on a manufacturing line you know, the entire system is is going to be uh, spoiled. So, for us to have young entrepreneurs who can create a value, uh, 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 having special purpose vehicles, which we are talking about, having the youth involved in agriculture, which has commercialized, having the youth who are going to uh, create, you know, uh, those clusters that can crowd in more others to participate more effectively, we need to start with that aspect of creating an economy itself which is a fit for the youth. And that economy resides in industrialization, not in a, uh, agriculture. People are talking about agriculture being the backbone of the economy. That's why you see that the, this backbone is not uh, 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 quite uh, firm enough to, to, to withstand a lot of challenges. That's why we can't create enough productive jobs. We can't uh, even, you know, create wealth which is sustainable. So there is going to be a need to twist the economy to be more uh, 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 oriented towards industrialization, and that's where uh, uh, a lot of my ideas, which uh, I contributed with a group of other colleagues of mine, uh, to, to the manifesto of, of, of the NRM party we are actually rooted in that. Okay, thank, thank, you. thank you so much, Ramadan. Uh, in the same regard, I think we shall now have uh, uh, Honorable Margaret Muhanga. Uh, as a legislator, I'm very sure there's been a lot of those legislations you have taken on, and among us those, there's definitely been those legislations that are for the youth getting empowered in leadership, which, or if uh, there's any, which legislations have you as legislators come up with and in that kind of line uh, boosted uh, the youth in their involvement in governance and leadership matters of the country? Honorable Muhanga. Thank you very much, moderator. And I'd like to thank Jacob so very much for his enlightenment to this country or to the world about the strides that government has taken to raise the profile of the youth and their participation not only in governance but only in economic development but we have got still many challenges yes we can bring the youth into um development or even into leadership but what type of leaders are we bringing? Are we bringing leaders that are not able to help other youth? You know, young people, I always tell young people that you can only make your life between 18 and 30 and you can break it in between that age group. After that, you may never be able to pick the rubbles and restart your life. You'll be too old to start your life because they say old age starts at 35, diminishing returns, that your life starts to weaken the moment you turn 35. And so you are at your best between 18 and 30. That's the time you make the most critical decisions of your life. Government can only put an enabling environment for you to thrive, for you to do something. I remember during our time, Museveni's time, when he had just come to power, I was a youth. 
where I was not yet a youth, but I became a youth during his time, there weren't as many opportunities as there are now. I have seen people who have used just simple talents, like singing, like stand-up comedy, and have become world celebrities, the unconsumers. But during our time, there wasn't even an opportunity. There was no enabling environment. So now, how have the older people helped the young? Because Uganda now having the youngest population, the second youngest population in the world, we really need to tap into who these young people are. Let's not take people to the university to study nothing, psychology, social sciences, I did mass com, but the market is so congested with those kinds of, of, of um, courses. What we need in Uganda are more technical schools or vocational training centers. Instead of your child having a degree in psychology, you'd rather your child has a skill. Because if you have your psychology degree, thank you very much, where are you going to use it? But if you have a skill, even in knitting, sewing, braiding your hair, it is such a life skill that will earn for you money than a university degree without a skill. You see, all these days I've been looking back at the syllabus that we were learning. When I grew up, became a journalist, started traveling. I reached all these places and wondered, the Canadian prairies, the rainlands, what were we studying since here? At what point is the Rhinelands ever going to help me in my growth, in my career, in my life? And that's why you go to Europe and they do not know anything to do with Africa. They are so blunt that they know we live in trees. But because they have the skill to develop their countries, they have thrived. One time I sat down to look for a university in China for my daughter. There are more technical schools in China than universities that teach these, these so-called um, courses that Ugandans love so much. We need to tell our parents, as parents, we need to talk to our children. The older people need to mentor the young people. These young people in the studio have awakened me Jacob has brought out very important issues. Our children are going to school, learning or studying, but what skills are they coming out with? Even if you had a degree in economics, where are you going to be employed? Or you are a banker, how many banks are in Uganda? How, what is their capacity? But if we all have skills, we can go in cottage industries that uh, uh, my fellow panelist Gobi was talking about countries that have taken strides in development and left us behind have used their young people into practical skills that can manufacture something. I have been to places, to countries where there is more or less nothing but they use anything that they have to manufacture something to weave, to knit. Imagine here in Uganda, we cannot make even a, a, a good wedding gown. We've got to import material, we've got to get some expertise, import embroidery. These are things that people do with their own hands. I met a 93-year-old woman in China because I had gone with a friend who imports wedding gowns. The 93-year-old woman knits all this embroidery that we find on the glamorous um, gowns that we are importing. Which school did she go to? Which university did she attend to learn knitting such things? We were limited in language, but I tried to ask our guide, 
the level of education of this woman, she did not have any basic qualifications, but she could do a lot. We have so many universities in Uganda, very few technical schools. There are so many technical institutes, or vocational training institutes, in Asia, in the Asian Tigers, more than the number of universities that exist. Even the universities that are there are teaching people at diploma level to learn, acquire a skill, and get a job. When you take a Ugandan to look for a job, everybody asks them, what, do, what can you do? Many of those countries which are thriving, they ask you, what can you do? Then you start, you know, for me, I studied psychology, I can counsel people. How many people need counseling? Honorable Mohanga, Honorable Mohanga, I, I, I wish to, to, to know from you, as a member of the August House, do you feel the August House has actually created an environ that helps us achieve those that you're pointing out right now? Definitely, the Parliament has enacted so many uh, uh, policies mm. that have not been followed. For example, even in the NRA manifesto alone, we must have a vocational training school in every county. Are they there? Not at all. The implementation has always been the problem. Parliament has enacted uh, laws that have helped the young people to enter leadership, like having a, f five members of parliament, and then not all, only limiting them to these five uh, slots, but also them participating and getting into many others. Now, what we need is not the quantity in numbers, but the quality of these young people. And those who mentor them. I will not point at people, but I have seen young people who have come to parliament where they are expected to be earning more and having no families as yet on which to spend their money. They squandered all their money and went to square zero. <laughs> this comes to mentoring. We need to mentor young people. We uh, need to speak to them, mm. to involve them, to engage them. I've met so many young people in my own private life that are so brilliant, so innovative, but they do not have anybody to mentor them, hold their hand, lift them up high, and then they would do better. Uh, Honorable, now, I'm, going to ask you, I'm going to ask you one more question, probably before we take a break. Um, when you look at the composition of parliament, but of course I'm looking at mm -hmm. the aspect of the youth leaders in parliament, do you feel there is need for more, or perhaps there is need to cut that, that, that number down? No, the five members are okay. Mm. Is but it enough? remember, we have so many others that are coming from constituencies, mm. but are young, below 35 and below 30. There are quite many members of parliament who are running not on that affirmative action seat for the youth, but going and grabbing constituencies from older people and or even competing with the, the same young people. The same way, Many women have left the affirmative action seat and competed with men so that we can have more people, more women in parliament, because women are considered a weaker sex. Women are considered vulnerable people. Now, if you have more women, that means they will advance more issues to do with women, maternal health, and so many others, women empowerment, women joining business, women getting out of the kitchen and performing other duties that they, would, they were not used to. And this is why we call upon the young people, come participate. A lot of people have got a phobia that you know young people are just noisy. Young people do not know the way. Young people do not know what they want. Let me tell you, young people know what they want. They only need to be listened to. I thank the president who has been listening to young people wherever he has passed. He has his rally, finishes it, meets only young people. They are so excited to meet him. They raise to him their problems. 
most of them very pertinent. That is the mentoring I'm talking about. Holding their hand and lifting them up high. There are so many people that have graduated. They have good qualifications, but they can't find jobs. The job market is so small. The public service or all government jobs are so few, less than a, a half a million. And yet the private sector has got 1.7 million jobs. Now, what we need to create here in Uganda is an enabling environment. When we speak about having no lawlessness in this country, we know what we are talking about. Which investor is going to come to Uganda to invest his millions of money, millions of dollars, when he knows that the next day there will be a group of people being incited to block roads, to ban cars, to, look, to loot shops? Nobody. The enabling environment means peace and security. It is very paramount. All right, honorable. The moment we have peace. Now, to the young people in this studio, kindly talk to other young people that you know to stop engaging in lawlessness. That makes their chances to thrive much less. Okay. But if the country was peaceful, Nobody is raising an eyebrow at an investor. Please, we shall go, we shall thrive. <laughs> this country will never go back where it Th was. Thank you so much, Honorable and Muhanga. And we trust you, young. Yes, thank you so much, Honorable Muhanga. We shall definitely pick it up from that point at uh, a further stage. Otherwise, um, we, sh we are on UBC Behind the Headlines. That is the hashtag on Twitter. You can as well search for the same on Facebook, UBC Behind the Headlines. We take a break for now. We shall be returning in a flash. Notice peanut butter. Mm. Enjoy mm. the whole test of Notiz Nacho Peanut Butter that spreads happiness to the whole family. Available in smooth, crunchy, and chocolate nut variants. Pick a size that fits your pocket from 125 grams, 250 grams, 400 grams, and 800 grams. Notiz Peanut Butter, the real peanut butter. Available in all leading supermarkets. Thank you, Kapo. Hey, Kapo, I see you really worked hard to get your business to this level. Who are you voting as a president in 2021? You're not supposed to ask me such a question. It is my secret. I cannot even tell my wife, not even my children. But anyway, I'll vote for my business. Sure. How do you vote for your business? Will it even be on the ballot paper? It may not, but I'll tell you this. I'll vote for that one person who will guarantee the prosperity of my business, who will make my business not to be disrupted at all, who will ease my transportation and my clearance of goods from border to Kampala, and I'll vote to secure my business's future. Don't gamble with your future and that of your beautiful country. Vote Yuwiri Kagutum Seveni on 14th January 2021 to secure your future. Capital Shoppers, we have a variety of items like gift hampers, foods, garments, cosmetics, and all sorts of drinks. Enjoy your shopping experience this festive season at affordable prices in our fully stocked branches in the following areas. In Tinder Stretcher Road, opposite Makere Business School along Port Bell Road, Duster Street opposite Nakasero Market, and Garden City on Yusuf Lule Road. To all our customers and suppliers, we thank you for your continuous support. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year 2021. Stay safe, wash your hands, sanitize and wear your mask always. Fruit vile fruit juice. 
Our journey begins in orchards where some of the best fruits are grown. Fruit Wild Fruit Juice is 100% natural with no added sugar filled with the wholesome goodness of vitamins and minerals that nourish your body and delight your taste buds. Enjoy real fruit juice in orange, tomato, apple, beetroot with mango, lemon mint with cucumber, mango, berry and tropical variants. Grab your fruit vial 100% fruit juice today. Available in all leading supermarkets. Welcome back from that break. This is UBC Behind the Headlines. My name is Tony Kent Chaze, sitting in for Charles Odongtho, as, as we did tell you a little while earlier. Well, during the break, someone was sending us messages and asking why we are having masks on. Well, it's not a secret any longer. COVID-19 is the main reason for which we are trying to protect ourselves as well as protect those that are seated or probably next to us in whichever way we get close. Um, Angela, you're going to vie for the youth member of parliament seat, that is for the, fi uh, the, the female, youth chair, uh, female youth member of parliament, that is nationwide. And uh, just as uh, Honorable Margaret did highlight, do you feel the youth representation in parliament is okay? The fact that we are the majority of the country, I, th I feel like the number of representatives in parliament are quite few. Um, okay, Honorable Mwanga had, Mwanga had said that uh, there are other young MPs. Mm. However, when it comes to a national level, so we have the National Female Youth MP, I f for gender equality, I think they should also be a National Male Youth MP. And when it comes to regional, I think there should be some gender equality when it also comes to picking up the, you know, the regional MPs. Mm. Um, so that the women and men can be represented both at national level and also regional level. Okay. Um, that, that's my opinion when it comes to the representative of uh, youth in parliament. I, I can already picture what you're going to present uh, on one of those order papers one time when you get into parliament, definitely. Uh, Jacob, um, you do represent uh, the Ministry of Labor, Gender and Social Development by being part of the National Youth Policy. Um, there are so many opportunities that you avail to the youth and that is in the line of culture, recreation, sports, employment, leadership itself, the one that we are tackling right now, and so many others uh, that is from the social, political, economic uh, line of uh, thought. How do these youth that are watching you right now tap into these opportunities? Is it a technical know-who? Because there's so many that think perhaps these are things for uh, particular people, you know, people with a certain kind of nose, maybe people who dress in a particular way. How do the youth tap into these opportunities? Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe let me, let, me, let me start from um, the initial point of representation. Uh, and it also builds on to the problem of, of why we have a problem with representation in Parliament. Uh, the, the channel of information flow uh, still has a problem in this country. That what happens at the top uh, does not uh, cascade down or trickle down does not with a lot of clarity. Mm. Uh, that extends to e e entirely what uh, we have, even for the youth programs. But let me first stick with Parliament. Uh, the members of parliament that are youth representatives to parliament are also members of the national youth council uh, by that virtue uh, and ideally for them to be effective or to pick issues from young people it, it would be as easy as consulting the members of national the national youth council that constitute your constituency um, if you're from western uganda um, you, you just uh, become um, the 
you know, uh, the person that consults the Western members of the Youth Council. If you're from the North, the same. Uh, and and th this is my conversation with uh, the NRM flag bearers going forward, um, that we, we need to inculcate a culture where representation is consultative. It is not... Um, uh, it is not some sort of end by you coming into parliament. Uh, and I believe that uh, parliament has a, a fund or a financing for constituency, okay? Uh, so I think that the youth members of parliament going forward, I, I don't know about the past so much, but going forward, um, the youth council will hold them very accountable to how much they do a consultative process. And uh, we'll be very particular about this country working for young people or for youth through the people that take positions uh, on behalf of young people. Um, so with regard to policies and programs and, and, and how they come down, I think that the first problem is communication. Even when there is 160 billion for the Youth Livelihood Fund and uh, then there is another about 40 billion for the COVID recovery uh, SME fund and now in yoga about 250 <coughs> billion with 50 billion being for Kampala and Wakiso alone. I, it is very hard to find people that have this information with clarity. But it's also very hard to know where the clarity of the information can be found. I, I'll give an example of Emyoga. The biggest channels of people in Kampala and Wakiso, youth, is Facebook, uh, is Twitter, you know, uh, but there is very little information on Emyoga on Facebook or on Twitter. Um, the Emyoga Twitter handle that I, I, I've seen does not have a tweet since last year when it was created. <laughs> so for, for me, th th that becomes the problem. Mm. Can we work out the communication of government can, initiatives? Can I come in? Uh, please. UBC, Uganda Broadcasting Corporation, has 11 radio stations and mm. four TV stations. How about we open this opportunity to, to you guys to come make use of it? Well, if you invite the Youth Council, the 11 NEC members will always come here. But uh, if you invite the Yoga people, I don't know if you'll attach a cost. For us as young people, we'll come free and will request to come in free. But, but to, make in my, uh, to, to put my point to bed, uh, I think that that's the first step, the mm. communication of these initiatives. And that is what we want to work on in these five years. That government is doing so much for young people and it is not being communicated. Now, the lack of communication produces a second problem, which is uh, incentivizing corruption. Because when we don't know that we have 250 billion we cannot ask for where the 250 billion has gone. So in, in the challenge of corruption that is in the country, you then allow people to proceed as if things are normal and not being known. Mm. And the young people at the villages, who are support, at the sub-county, who are supposed to receive of the, the, the livelihood fund, or at the constituency, who are supposed to receive <coughs> of the Emyoga fund, in their lack of knowledge, the funds come to their districts or don't even reach there and they disappear in thin air. I think that it is time for us to make the effort as young people and leaders of young people to become the, 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 the people that look at the development of our country as our responsibility. And it starts with the population that can drive uh, our, our, our development. Uh, and I want to agree with Angela that if you're a majority population, uh, then you need to be seen as a majority population, especially in how you drive the country forward and not in simply how you demand from, from the country. Mm. Uh, uh, the final uh, thing that I see as missing is the, the, the politics of the country. <clears throat> I think that for a long time, young people have been a beneficiary of no research, uh, that we just listen to the airwaves, uh, political talk shows like these, and uh, depending on who is the most creative with language here, young people are very happy and they are very convinced. <laughs> uh, uh, and I think that that, that that culture needs to change. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Because a country's development is hinged on figures, on actual measurements. When the World Bank uh, is saying Uganda is among the fastest growing in 2020 in the presence of COVID at 2.1% growth, what does that mean to a young person's mind? That is something we should... E evaluate and, and preach to them 
in terms of where we are going as a country. Uh, and I feel like that is a missing link mm. uh, in, in the political participation of young people. If we can become more research-based, uh, want to engage with more information and less rhetoric, um, we can then achieve a situation where the policies that are for benefiting young people begin to take them uh, ahead. And I want to own that responsibility. Wow. I want the National Youth Council to own that responsibility mm. for us to preach. Finally, when we are able to preach, we can now get reviews from young people mm. uh, because the information is out in the public. Yes. I'll give you a situation. One of the best debates we have had in this country was a debate around the um, change of uh, the uh, constitutional provisions of the age limit. The reason why that debate was one of the best we had was because every single person at every level of society was listening and following. Mm -hmm. And so they were giving their opinions based on the arguments made by the political players. Uh, and, and I think that this would easily translate back if we were able to, um, as young people, or the structure of leadership of young people, if we are able to get this approach of when you put out information, you receive a lot of feedback and therefore you're able to inform a better approach. The challenges in there receive a better platform for, for, for redress. I think that that is uh, what is lacking and that uh, can take us forward. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jacob. I can see there is a message here coming off uh, Twitter. That is at UBC TV Uganda. Um, a one Ramadan Chimbugwe. I was getting scared thinking it's Ramadan mm -hmm. Gobi opting for Twitter, yet he's on Zoom. Well, Ramadan Chimbugwe says, politics and governance in UG needs to evolve from a top-down approach to a collaborative approach. Uh, that is to a collaborative approach between government, civil society, and citizens. He continues to say, Legis legislation and policies need to transform to allow and encourage collective thinking processes and decision making. By the way, for you that is watching us, simply look out for that hashtag, UBC Behind the Headlines, and share with us what your thoughts are, or probably what your thought is, so we can as well incorporate it in what we are having this particular time. Uh, getting to you, Gloria, uh, from ISEC, an NGO, non-governmental organization, there's always been friction uh, when it comes to NGOs and government programs. Because somewhere, somehow, uh, you're so much inclined towards uh, probably the foreign, foreign, you know, muscle, that is donors and, and the likes, and uh, perhaps often uh, fall onto the wrong side of government somewhere, somehow, somewhere, somehow. In the recent weeks, we had that uh, about two or three NGOs had issues somewhere, somehow. And I'm wondering, in as far as uh, the politics, uh, the politics of this country, uh, I know you do not want to talk so much about politics, but in as far as the politics of this country, which is becoming uh, the employer for so many, and, and in this case, the youth, uh, do you feel the youth are getting into that kind of leadership, the political bit of the leadership, for the reality of wishing to serve, or perhaps it's an option they have to take on since they have no other way out? Well, um, it, it, it really depends. It's really, that question is quite very subjective. Mm. I would say majority of the youth right now want to do something that benefits them. Yes, they want to do something that propels them forward, depending on their dreams, depending on their vision, depending on, on what they want to see. But for some of the youth, we have also been frustrated by the politics in the country, probably, or by the situations in the country. Right now, as a young person, if you want to walk to any public office, the chances of you getting a uh, gateway through is very difficult. By virtue of your appearance, by virtue of being young, you won't get through. So at the end of the day, some youth are actually frustrated. They feel like, okay, we actually need to take a more proactive step Mm. towards the governance of this country because 40 years down the road we are going to be here our grandfathers are not going to be here our fathers are not going to be here so some obviously take on because they want to serve they want to serve the nation they want to do something they want to take proactive steps in the governance of this country yes. but also for some of course at some point some humans but not by nature we are selfish mm. it takes a more proactive step for you to say okay let me actually serve mm. the people because that is why i'm there 
but it also goes back to our upbringing as as individuals how are we how are we brought up are you brought up as an individual who is self-centered this is mine this is mine or are you brought up as an individual who looks out for society so the question is quite subjective because it really depends on, on how someone has grown up as a young person and how frustrated they are if you're not very frustrated you might actually go there for your personal benefit if you're frustrated by how things are operating in the country which many are then most of them are going to go there because we want to actually serve because we know that 10 years down the road or 40 years down the road this nation is ours as we know the statistics but by 2050 the population is going to have tripled and it's all going to be youth and it is going to be us so at the end of the day as young people we take different steps some will go to parliament obviously some will have the courage to rise above and say let me stand for a position while another one will say let me go to the street and riot because either way at the end of the day we have to get what we want okay yes well thank you so much gloria i, I want to turn to dennis um i, I actually got a, a bit of an opportunity to read through one of the documents you presented uh, as you did share with us and uh, i'm wondering because when you look at the national youth policy uh, it takes us back to the 60s the 70s uh, where probably we had the farmers union the students unions all as initial unions that were under uh, the policy of the youth or the policy for the youth currently we have the national youth policy and perhaps uh, i'm not so sure but uh, uh, it's likely that you're going to tell me as a land valuer probably you would feel there are youth that are into that kind of line or lineage that is real estate, land and the likes. And perhaps as well, you in that kind of category might need a special, you know, a bit of attention directed at you. Or let's say um, a, a land valuers union, a, a land valuers youth union, or maybe youth union of the land valuers, just as it was back in the days. Uh, students union, farmers union, but all of those for the youth. I don't know. What's your take on that? Uh, Mr. Kent, uh, thanks so much once again. Um, I think I'm actually in the right place as I talk now. Uh, mm. My my colleague here, um, Mr. Jacob, Jacob uh, mm. made mention of, uh, I, I was noting what he was, uh, the points he was putting across. Uh, he made mention that uh, currently, uh, the country is working for the youth, but afterwards uh, he had to say that also with the youth we have a role to carry on this country. Mm. So I, I, want, I want to relate this to, to some of the projects that, uh, that I've worked on, others are still ongoing. Uh, mm. When he made mention that the country is working for the youth, I was like, this is actually not what we're supposed to be looking at. We're mm. supposed to be look at, looking at what can the youth do for this country. Okay. And that is actually what my research is centered mm. on. You're, you're, you're so much uh, focused on what the youth, what can, the youth can do for this country. Put onto the table put onto rather the than table. what they can take off the table. Yeah. Mm. Like I told you, I'm, I'm, I'm looking from this from the uh, land, economics pa land, perspective. land economics perspective. Yes. And uh, um, one of the um, study that I did was... Um, Taxation and economic development, like, like I made mention earlier on. Mm. And uh, the most recent one that I, uh, I actually shared it with uh, uh, some gentleman and the advice he gave me were very positive. Uh, it's actually, uh, I'm trying to answer the issue of uh, poverty, unemployment, and in inequalities in Uganda. Yes. So many people have written about these professors. And, and the likes they've, re they've talked about this, but no one has like pinpointed at the real issues of unemployment and uh, poverty and uh, inequality. Uh, b basically, I've looked at this thing from uh, what from, um, uh, from 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 the the issue of land, la the land ownership, and uh, I have analyzed this thing how 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 the issue of land ownership in Uganda mm. translates into what. Poverty. Probably to, 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 to give us a bit of an insight, how does the land problem uh, translate uh, the same issue you talked about, the poverty bit of it? Uh, the poverty bit of it, uh, this, this is a study uh, that was done by uh, uh, Professor Thomas Piketty. Uh, I think, yeah, Thomas Piketty. 
and uh, he has written about capitalism in the 21st century. Mm. He, he talked about uh, how the returns on these forms of capital ownership can, in the end, lead to a lot of wealth gap between the rich and the poor. Mm. And he has looked at the rate of return, uh, the after-tax rate of return. Economists have had arguments about the opti optimal tax rate, like uh, if you are to charge me a tax rate, which rate is opti optimal? Like you're benefiting uh, and I'm also benefiting. I presented this study in the, uh, to, to the Ministry of Finance. Mm. I, I, I looked at uh, our current system of land valuation and uh, I, I wouldn't say like our current issue of land valuation, but uh, I've looked at the international valuation standards and uh, what I may call uh, it's called like th the national standards, like how within a given society or a, a country, how people can adopt what their kind of valuation. So I've, I've kind of looked at in our system, basically how we are doing valuation and what the international perspective, the international valuation standards, w what they look at. And uh, in my presentation, I realized that um, the way we are doing valuation here it actually pinches what uh, someone who is supposed to pay these taxes compared to if like we had stick really to the international valuation standards mm. and uh, how does this bring about let me say poverty and inequality we we, we all need money to buy land but then uh, the instances when we get to realize that what if the cost of land is too much compared to what we are earning and maybe what I have in my pocket? Several studies uh, have been carried out, for instance, the International Housing Coalition. Themselves, they have said that the cost of land in Uganda is actually too high, but they have not given a solution to this. So actually, my study has addressed this thing, uh, pinpointing at by how much is the cost of land in Uganda expected. Mm. And in that study, I realized that... Uh, actually land in Uganda, if you are, okay, supposing someone buys land like at 20 million, according to basically what, is, uh, what we are doing, mm -hmm. like what we may call the national way of doing our valuation. Yeah. Supposing someone buys this land at- The national at valuation at like standards. No, I'm, I'm still looking at supposing you, you, you came to me and I gave you what? An advice mm. on how much you should buy this land basing on our practice here. I may advise you that you're supposed to buy this land at maybe 20 million. But when I analyze this situation using the international standards, I find that this land should have been like around 10 to 12 million. Mm. So like how does this affect the, the youth? So many, some people have written about this. I remember this an article that was written by Edris Chigundu talking about uh, why would I buy a plot of land in Naguru, which is <laughs> way much more expensive compared to uh, someone who is buying the, 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 uh, same, the same size and plot of land Actually, that one is else. not land. is buying a fully furnished building in mm. the UAE. Mm. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that my, 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 my kind of analysis answers this question. Okay. And uh, I'm saying that I'm in the right place. Uh, he, he made mention of... Uh, about 40 billion or 250 billion available for the youth. Mm. And I think I may have to grab some of this opportunity mm. to continue. <laughs> yeah, actually, let me bring him on. Uh, mm. Jacob, probably <coughs> respond. You had a bit of uh, itching issues when he was making his submission. Do it in a little bit of a brief so we can get to Ramadan. Thank you. Um, with all due respect to my brother, uh, the great researcher, because I can hear he's, he's good in his craft. Um, land. I, even if you were to own 100 acres of land, mm. uh, you could still be a poor person. And there uh, are so many like that in our, in our countryside. <laughs> I, I think that the correlation mm. um, that he is trying to draw is very far-fetched. I, I think that it does not fit youth. Uh, but I also want to borrow from Honorable Mohanga. She mm. said the role of government is to create an enabling environment. It is the best place to understand that our country, Uganda, is the best place. Because when you have a very big turnover from uh, youth or youth coming from school to the job market, in, in our country, it's one of the highest in the, in the world. Now, in that case, you mean, it means that the creation of job opportunities 
uh, either in the public sector or in the private sector by big investment will always be a chasing of the population okay that comes into the job market so job uh, unemployment is always going to be uh, a, a, a job supply question it's not going to be a job demand question in that end what you need is to advocate for how people come into the market to create mm. not coming into the market to demand mm. um, when people create in the market and those creations can become something uh, beneficial or uh, economically feasible uh, and returning, then you can begin to look at how uh, the country progresses on unemployment. Our country, each year, is having more young people coming into the job market, True. and we will not match that with investment that provides jobs, unless we invest in the very people who are coming out to present them with an, a market opportunity. So, so I, I would like to extend finally to say that in our country therefore what you need um, for young people is for them to fit into 21st century opportunities mm. if there is fast enough internet everywhere in the country it means I can trade with Kenya I can communicate and trade with with uh, South Sudan and all these nearby markets it means you create hot spots of trade um, where there would have not been any because now you have enabling environment um, and what those people need is not a piece of land it is um, much more a capital incentive a capital input mm. to start something very small uh, and uh, as a member of the NRM I'd like, I'd like to um, also add that that identification I have now learned that uh, Ramadan Gobi um, the economist uh, added to you know that, that, that content that content of saying let's refocus the economy to be based on cottage enabling uh, and not that just large-scale industrialization helps to now create very many small uh, businesses that employ one two three people mm -hmm. that get out of the informality of the economy and join the formality of the economy if you have what we have in our country 82 percent of the youth population is literate but the average for the whole country is 73% thereabout. Yeah. It means that we have more literacy among young people mm. than, um, than has ever been in this country. Take advantage of that opportunity of literacy and the enabling environment and the monitoring and evaluation that is appropriate to create young people that are focused on how do I come out to start something that can sustain me than how do I come out to look for a job uh, because um, you're not going to have enough jobs for mass communication students. You're not going to have enough jobs for social scientists. Mm. Even engineers will not get enough jobs, or they'll not get the pay they expect from school in this economy in the short run. So these are things we can achieve in the long run, but we need to have action in the short run that has great dividends across the country. I I'm going to ask my panelists. Uh, I know, Dennis, you might have wanted to say something. Probably you'll, you'll say that in uh, the next uh, bit of, of interval that you'll have to speak. I'm going to ask you, my panelists, to, to, to all get your pens and pieces of paper ready because at this juncture, I, I am going to, to, to request my, my, my Zoom panelists, that is Ramadan Gobi and Honorable Muhanga, uh, to probably fire you a bit of uh, friendly fire that is questions uh, probably one question a piece uh, from uh, ramadan gobi to each and every one of you as well as from honorable margaret muhanga ramadan yes uh, probably you did not get me clear I'm, I'm 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 actually now turning the attention to you to to probably have some bit of uh, a conversation with uh, the guests in, in uh, the, the studio. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I, I am impressed with the, with the submissions, but I would like to know uh, first from Gloria, uh, whether they, they, they as well consider uh, at their institute, the idea of having the need to integrate STEM, uh, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the package that they uh, 
give to the youth using interdisciplinary and applied kind of approach so that we do not uh, necessarily get the youth to concentrate on getting a degree but on having uh, practical skills which are relevant for the 21st century and beyond. Then uh, to Jacob, what uh, being at the National Youth Council, what particular role as a council do you think the youth can practically play in changing the attitude amongst the the younger people themselves in thinking that it is government that is failing them and they have no role whatsoever uh, in having their own lives uh, changing to those they need to, to, to see, you know, living. I'm talking from the perspective of you know, uh, when I was a younger man, I was taught by my mother that there is nothing like a free lunch. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've been uh, carrying that with me over over the years. I, I know that someone else will only come in to push me, but not to pick me up. And then to uh, my aspirant, Angela. Miss Cass Angela. Angela, mm. I think she. We have, we have actually had conversations on Twitter with the with the that younger lady, with the, a boomerang generation that you are trying to to come out and 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 lead, aspiring to lead. Boomerang generation is is quite a, a young adult. We define it as young adults that li live with their parents after they have failed to build the capacity to move out of home. M most of the younger Ugandans, when they finish university, the, the, the younger people I teach at moves and other places, they go back home because they, they, they can't uh, you know, have capacity to, to start their lives because in, in Uganda we have very few jobs and a few opportunities at the moment. Now, with that boomerang generation, what particular strategies or ideas do you have in getting such a generation to look at the opportunities created in the wider economy instead of just uh, waiting for the job with their application later so that they can be able to take that advantage of the environment? Uh, which uh, my fellow panelist, Honorable Muhanga, was talking about. There are a lot of opportunities in Uganda, but uh, quite a few younger people, especially those who have gone to school, are finding it difficult to identify them. Uh, a, a recent household survey found actually that the educated younger people are more unemployed than the non-educated. So what kind of strategies do you have as a younger leader who's aspiring to lead them in changing that? And finally, to the land economist. Dennis. Dennis. Mm. Uh, uh, we share some DNA having uh, that economics <laughs> bit of it. What do you think are the three uh, primary ways through which government can influence job creation in the market economy because now the key idea for the next five years is how do we influence the market economy to create jobs we have had jobless growth so what are the key about three of them key things that government can do to influence that job creation in a market economy thank you all right thank you so much ramadan uh, probably each and everyone has noted those questions. Let's go straight to Honorable Margaret Muhanga so she can as well pass us those questions. And then when we get into the answer session, we shall have uh, both questions from, from both panelists on Zoom. 
uh, coming our way as responses from you. Yes, Honorable Muhanga. Yes, thank you, Tony. I would like to ask um, the two young ladies together, mm. Gloria and Angela. Yes. As young women leaders, how are you prepared to mentor other young girls to first of all join leadership and to secondly be focused on what they want to do in the future? Because as leaders, you are meeting a lot of other people that you can help lead a better life. And to the two gentlemen, Dennis is a researcher and he is really um, well focused. Jacob is at the same level, very focused, enlightened and truthful. What do you think this government should do to interest young people in self-employment? Now that the jobs, the white collar jobs are really few, many people are educated without skills that the employer would really want. How do you encourage those people? Or how can you advise government on what to do to interest these young people into self-employment because there is a young person who taught me something i have never forgotten she told me that even if she goes to school and finishes as an engineer she will never look for a job the reason was she has never met anybody who works for the other she has met, never met any rich person who works for another person. All rich people employ themselves. And so she made her vow that the moment I finish school, I will employ myself. And I thought that was a brilliant idea. If you have your skill, you can employ yourself and even employ others and you become the boss. But how can we help our young people to stop looking at government or a white collar job for employment. Indeed, Dr. Ramadan Gobi has said many uneducated young people have jobs, but then the educated one don't have jobs. Mm. So you look at that juxtaposition and see where the problem lies. Thank you very much, young people. Stay blessed. Okay, thank you so much, Honorable. Uh, but definitely stay stay uh, uh, connected because we shall probably come back to you uh, to say goodbye at uh, the list of uh, the show. Um, before we get into the responses, which I will probably start off with uh, uh, Jacob, there is a message here coming off uh, uh, WhatsApp. Someone is following us from Nakasero and says they need to... To, uh, we need a lot of human resource training in the country. That is human resource training that is basically focused on youth training. That is Council Alex Akampurira. Then I do see a message here coming off our live stream on Facebook. Uh, it's coming in from Victor Koyas Seva Kije. He says, hi, greetings. We as the youth designed a car biometric ignition system at Macquarie University, and this system would be helpful in car security of our country. Unfortunately, we moved almost to every platform that would aid our invention, but we failed. So the government should put in place innovation platforms to enhance technology. Well, to you, Victor Koya Sebakije, you can be sure government has had that, and it's had it quite clearly. Uh, getting to you, uh, my brother Jacob, the questions were clear. And uh, uh, from, from what uh, Ramadan actually put to you, he was asking what in particular uh, the roles you have as a council that can help you know, change the attitudes of the youth uh, in the aspect of government is failing them. And of course, uh, the bit of what uh, Honorable Muhanga pointed out, uh, the whole bit of basically the same. How do you stop the youth from government to yambe, that kind of thing? Uh, Probably thank. you can answer that in uh, at most four minutes, but three could do. Thank you, uh, Kant, and again, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ramadan. 
and, and, and uh, Honorable Mohanga. First, uh, like Sewa Kija has said, mm. he, I have invented something, I'm going everywhere, I can't see anything. And yet there is an active innovation fund at the Ministry of uh, ICT. Yes. I think, therefore, that the first role we can play as the youth that have access to information, who can demand it uh, by virtue of a mandate, you know, mm. of the Youth Act uh, in Section 3, we can be able to provide information for youth to know whatever is there. Uh, and for me, this is very critical, uh, that we know where the youth are because we are there. Uh, I am on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, the Youth Council is there. The first principal role we have is to disseminate information. People will not get interested in starting businesses if they don't even know they can access capital. Um, because they, these basic principles of business uh, are taught at senior one, uh, they, they are taught in primary school. Uh, how you start an idea is by selling two pancakes and, and so all, all, all these things. Uh, there's these jokes uh, that, that we make, you know. But th that's the principle that we need to get the information out. And getting information out for it to be productive information, uh, it needs to reach a critical mass of the population of youth. And that critical mass then can access um, these ends. Um, so I think that our first practical role is to be informants to, to the general public. But, but secondly, having access at every level mm. means we have uh, also the opportunity to use that, it, it, it might be pseudo power, but it is influential. Yes. If we can use that um, to be the mouthpieces of government intervention for youth mm. with regard to job and wealth creation, then we can become, in a way, the vehicle, the special purpose vehicle that communicates to youth that, look, you can be more. Okay? Yes. Here are two things that I think are important. Um, the first thing is that to change attitude towards wanting jobs to creating them, People need to actually stop being scared of creation. Uh, and I think that creation is such a scary process. Mm. Um, when, when I first attempted to open a company, uh, I could not believe just the, the sophistication of the creation. The legal implications, how many lawyers I needed to consult, and so on. If I want to start a business that is formal and has a bank account, um, and I'm at university level, I need to have a minimum of 300, 400,000. Um, honestly, for youth that have to struggle through education, that's a big ask to get them interested in opening, uh, starting a company. But um, if you tell them that, look, we're going to give you 10 million in this grouping or something, then someone needs to say, okay, fine, you now have access to capital. But the next question is, will I succeed? The, the, business, uh, the, the business death rate in our country is alarming. You know, over 90% of businesses created die in the first year. That is largely a management question. Uh, but are there any successful businesses that we can tell young people to look to uh, that have been managed and have been brought out by young people? I'll give you an example. In um, Kampala and Wakiso alone, over uh, 4,000 beneficiaries of Emioga have already existed. Yeah. Um, but we do not know them. We don't know if they have succeeded or they have failed. The Youth Livelihood Program um, has uh, been able to have at least 21,000 youth uh, receive funds directly. But we don't see stories on media of someone who succeeded somewhere. And I think these success stories would then change the perception that it is impossible. Because Every time we are inspired by a story of success, we are able to have more young people desire to attempt it. Uh, it's just like mathematics in, uh, at all level. Mm. When you're looking at all these things and all these equations, uh, but you know that someone last year got uh, a distinction and so on, uh, you also feel like maybe it is possible. So I think that's important. Finally, um, to answer what should government do to interest young people. Now, I think that young people are interested, uh, and I don't want to say young people are not interested. I think that government has a responsibility, first of all, to provide for young people. But to get them interested, they're already interested. No one doesn't want to be wealthy. Uh, the, the question is, how do we meet them midway? Their aspiration to get wealthy and the provisions, okay, that they need to go through to get wealthy. And I think that for me, 
th there's a need for beneficiary, um, what, what I would call a fusion of young people. This fellow that comes from the university uh, and moves around the job market for two years, dropping applications everywhere, can be the same person that you say, please go to the sub-county in your village and help them access youth livelihood funds mm. and be a part of that village circle or that uh, sub-county circle that accesses that fund. Such that you are a part in their illiteracy, you are a part of the process. For me, the creation uh, of, of, of jobs in our country, uh, and I'm not answering for my brother, but the, the, the jobless growth can be answered in the value chain we create. That you're having so much production that does not trigger down um, into creating jobs along the value chain. And I think that that is something that we need to work on with specific interest for young people. Yes. That is why as a, a new National Youth Council, we want to have conversations with Operation Wealth Creation, want to have uh, um, uh, conversations with, with government attempts to capitalize the economy and say, what are you capitalizing? How does it go down? And can we design a program that young people can be along that going down mm. before we just export um, these materials? So that we have job full growth and not just jobless growth. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Jacob. Uh, probably, Angela, you're ready. Um, uh, yeah, Ramadan asked you a bit of an interesting query that university finalists go back home after, after their finals and it's definitely a boomerang generation. So he's wondering what strategies you have to uplift them as uh, a young leader. And then two, the aspect of how you can uplift the ladies, or rather, yes, the young girls out there, to actually take up leadership and stay focused as it was put to you by Honorable Muhanga. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gobi and Honorable Muhanga and also Kent. Mm. Um, I'll just look at it from the aspect of my agenda. So I'm actually uh, quite happy that uh, Mr. Gobi also mentioned the skilling and also Honorable Mohanga because that is what I would like to advocate for, which is universal vocational education. Mm. We already do have the skilling programs. We already do have the vocational institutes all over the country, over 80 uh, vocational institutes. However, I would like to look at it at a point where it's, it's free and accessible and not just free and accessible, but where you also involve the industrial sector. So right now, the uh, industry sector contributes around 26.9% to GDP, which we need to focus on. Um, so basically, in, at this point, um, they'll be also involved in delivering quality training to, mm. the, to the young people. And um, with this, the private sector also needs to be involved and invest in the training of the young people when it comes to vocational training. Okay. Um, when I look at, uh, we always look at government, you know, to solve our, all our problems. But I would like the young people now to just think and look outside the box. What other institutes can help them? So if we look at now having the government working with the private sector in terms of bringing um, the issues of unemployment and helping young people get <coughs> opportunities and also civil society which can also help young people in terms of training when it comes to youth leadership um, so in terms of uh, the skilling bit i'll give you an example there are people in university for example there are some youth leaders in university that actually do make cakes in their rooms and then there are others that make that uh, tailoring in, in, the, in their homes also. Yeah. So the skilling bit of it is that someone can gain a skill, but what value do they get from that? So that's the whole point of the, the agenda, bringing the industrial sector in order to you know, get that value. And then also looking at the industry sector, it also helps enhance the agriculture sector. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of an umbrella helping all the sectors. Um, in relation to the young leaders, um, how to mentor young women. I'll just talk about my own opinion, my own experience. I think for young women, we also need to look at uh, women role models, the ones we look. We need leaders that can give young women hope that they can do something. Mm. Because uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, young girls and the girl child, we get, uh, you know, we, we face our issues um, in terms of, let's say, abuse or discrimination. Yeah. And we need to look at women that have actually made it up there and you know, tell ourselves that that is what I want to be and that is what I can do for the future. Mm. Um, if, they, if at least we can talk about our experiences, 
um, and also have some training programs for them where we can um, freely discuss the sensitive issues rather than just um, you know panel beating the issues but yeah. just bringing it out and say this is what women face women in leadership face the process of getting there and also the young girls you know in school um, we need to bring these issues out and also when we get the platform like now to also speak out and um, you know to so that the, the young girls and the women out there don't feel like they're alone in it so that they know that you know we know what they're facing and we are there for them okay. so that is uh, my point of view well thank you so much angela um definitely i'm sure uh, dennis is quite ready uh, first and foremost uh, uh, ramadan gobi applauded you for having some trait like he does uh, probably the bit of uh, being an economist of sorts and well the question he fired you as well as uh, the bit of how you can help uh, young ones stop looking to government as well as white collar jobs in in probably three four minutes yeah thanks so much uh, mr kent uh, uh, before i proceed on to answering what uh, dr ramadan and uh, honorable honorable margaret have asked me uh, i first wanted to to get a little bit uh, back briefly and i clarify on what probably that do that in in a minute yeah yeah, yeah. In a minute. V very briefly yeah uh, in case i did mention that uh, uh, my study on the the, the land uh, solves the issue of unemployment <coughs> i think basically that was like a slip of the tongue but this thing basically looks at poverty and inequality and me i just came in to pinpoint by how much are these properties overvalued mm -hmm. and uh, I had actually not known uh, that this study was also done by uh, Dr. 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 Fred Mohomoza and it was published last year by Oxfam. Wow. So me, as I was doing my work, I just came across that. Wow. And my study basically answers, like you saw what happened about a few weeks ago, uh, the, r the riots starting most especially in the city areas of the, of the what? Of, of our urban town, centers. Of, of the urban centers yeah. and my study points out that basically it's in these urban centers whereby these high land values translate into high cost of housing and at the end of the day everyone gets frustrated mm. the money you're earning is all going what to, to, to pay rent it's a chain it, and how do we understand this the, the house price models conventional standards using all what all free market economies. Okay. So these are the things that I brought in to analyze this. Okay, so back to, to, to Ramadan <coughs> Gobi's question. That was uh, a very wonderful dissection though. Yeah, mm. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, back to Dr. Uh, Ramadan Gobi and Honorable Margaret answering their question is like, I'm just repeating what they already mentioned. Mm. I am a researcher and uh, I would really have to take this time to c congratulate what they, t what, what, what they spoke out uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, at the beginning of this discussion, uh, she made mention of um, first of all uh, the skilling being paramount, the, the, the mentoring, cre creation of institutions and taking course schools. Th these are the s these are some of the issues. As I was uh, doing my research, I came across Th these are the same things that most of the countries are looking forward to in order to what to provide what employment mm. Se be it self-employment or even the private sector as what employing some of this youth mm. and uh, uh, specifically to mr gobi uh, <coughs> is he asked me the three key ways to influence job creation in the market economy i'm looking at only one bit of this and uh, the access to cam capital do, I mean, Mr. Jacob made mention of the access to capital. Yeah. There is something, Mr. There is something Dr. Gobi um, said here uh, a few weeks ago. I think that was in August. So you follow the show? <laughs> I follow this show. Wow, wow. He talked about something to do with what? Predatory lending. Yes. He, he was looking at, he was basically talking about the high interest rates. Mm. When I was doing my study during the COVID-19, I came across a, a journal and they were talking about uh, how business should behave in what in, in in such times very difficult times someone who is entering a business should first of all make sure that the cost of capital is way below the returns on that business and do you know what it means to get a return on your business that amounts to like the 20 percent 22 percent which is the uh, basically on average the lending rates in the country 
it's almost impossible. Most of the business here, I think they get, let me say if after tax, or, uh, let me look at these small, small businesses. The only return they can get, at most like 8% rate of return. He made mention that 80% or 90% of these businesses end up collapsing and he says it's about management. It's not about management. It's about the cost of capital being too high. It's okay. being too high. So it, 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 it can't actually what facilitate these businesses to carry on. Okay. I actually met a friend of mine and uh, she was telling me, Dennis, I've tried three bus businesses but they have all failed. So the only thing I wanted to venture into is what? Is real estate. Mm. So it, it actually got back to what? To my mind and my line of research. I was like, why is this lady uh, trying to look into real estate now? So I was like, since this real estate transaction in Uganda is not, re it, it's like not so much regulated. Yeah. Someone buys a plot of land at People 10 million. He, wa he waits for two years. He sells it at 20 million. Mm. That is not how it works. I, I, I put that one in my study. How, how, how Uganda. So probably, let's do this. Let's do this, Dennis. Um, mm. what, is your, what is the title of your latest study? More, more so that study. Uh, my mentioned, title mentioned of it. the latest study is uh, the, um, the social costs and impacts of uh, Uganda's real property market. Uh, is it available anywhere? Probably online? Uh, I have not, uh, not yet published it, and I think I'm not so much entitled to publishing these things. Mm. I've, I've tried to follow up how you're supposed to publish these things. Most especially they want maybe if you have studied a master's maybe in research or uh. you have maybe a PhD which I don't have but mm. have the passion for my research. Okay, let me put this to you because <coughs> we are running out of time, yes, definitely. Yes. Um, yes. Would you advise your young brother, your young sister or any other member of your family to, to take up a, 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 research, a research job? In, in, the, in the pursuit of, let's not pursue the white collar jobs. Research, research is like, uh, it's, it's actually the only key, is, is the only... Let, let's make it simple. In mm. a yes or no response, would you advise them to take up research jobs? It's, it's, it's automatically a yes. Okay, that it's, is very good. Let, let, let's get to Gloria. Let's yes. get to Gloria. <coughs> um, uh, Ramadan actually mentioned something that I came across when I was interacting with uh, Kaino Africa. They do uh, early childhood development, and one of those, you know, systems they, uh, they, they adopt, or rather they, they make use of, is the STEM. And when Ramadan made mention of it, the science, technology, engineering, and math, and how you can integrate it to the youth and uh, probably help them out, I, I was like, okay, this is something that can as well happen or probably get implemented at uh, a, a stage a little uh, much, much, much higher than the toddlers or the young ones. But in the same regard, um, Madame, Madame Muhanga, that is Honorable Muhanga, was asking about uh, how you can help the young generation of the ladies into leadership, but as well help them keep focused on that that they pursue. Mm. Yes, about the STEM, he asked how, do we, how have we integrated it into our programs. Now, as ISEC, we develop skills of young people in two different, in two, two ways. One, there's the membership, or let's say the staff of the organization who are young people, and they learn the different skills. Then we have the young people that we keep sending for exchange. We call, we call it exchange programs where a young person leaves this country and goes to another country and works with another organization. It, it can be a professional internship or a volunteering experience. And we have the STEM incorporated in this. There are so many opportunities that we have for young people where they can actually go and practice their skills in, in, in the science field, in the technology field. We have actually sent out quite a number of Ugandans in the IT sector. We have sent them to different, to Tata Consultancy, which is a very huge IT firm in the world, mm. for them to actually keep practicing the skills. And then when they are through, they can actually come back to this country and implement. So STEM is something that we have incorporated. We have these various opportunities for young people. And we also even have created these opportunities here within the country. We have worked with Buraga Hospital for young people to go and see how do we actually become better in the science, in the science field or in the technology field, even mm. in the engineering. We have quite a number of opportunities. There was an opportunity in Rwanda for engineering students or for students who are interested in engineering. And you had to just go and work with these people, see how does the other culture do it, how do they, how do, they do engineering in another country. 
and how best what can I learn from them that I can actually come to Uganda and execute it could be a different perspective altogether okay. of course we can't say uganda is the you know bedrock of everything mm -hmm. so when you go and experience these different cultures but at least it's the pearl of africa yeah mm -hmm. yes it's the pearl of africa <laughs> yes but when you go and experience the different culture and come back you get mm -hmm. a completely different perspective definitely and you get a your mind opens up and you learn so many things that you're actually able to execute here within the country so yes we have that that practical skilling in stem mm. And then the other one is how am I prepared to mentor young girls? I think by virtue of my role, I have had quite a number of leadership positions, right from primary through secondary, through campus, and now I'm even out of campus. I have had quite a number of roles. And my role at ISIC, I was doing um, human resource management. I was responsible for the development of 150 young people. But 70% of those were girls. Our organization has majority, 70%. And we had to structure a whole program of how do we actually train these young people through the different skills. How do we encourage them? We don't discriminate in our organization. We absolutely don't discriminate. Me being the overall head when I'm a girl already says something. So we always keep encouraging the girls to take up these various roles. We have a mentorship program with the uh, Middle East Africa Alumni Network. And we keep encouraging everyone, but even especially the girls, take up the roles, take up the roles, apply by virtue of being in that role. But we also run, yes, the different mentorship programs, as I've said, within the organization. So if there are young people out there, especially the girls, it's, I, I don't believe that it's, it's very difficult. It's a matter of staying focused. What do you want? And that is what we train young people on. What exactly do you want to do? We give you the platform practice whatever you want to practice at the end of the day you will find yourself at the end of the day you will know that okay i did this i didn't like it i did that i liked it this is the path for me to go so yes i, I believe for mentorship i'm very prepared we have organized quite a number of mentorship programs within the organization we have led quite a number of girls to take on leadership positions so it's, it's generally part of what i do Okay. Well, I can assure you all uh, on this platform that you'll have some time on one of our sister uh, brands, that is Magic 100 FM, so you can expound on these issues and probably help the population learn more and more so for you, Jacob, because where you at, Emioga and others, we might need to talk and have a little bit of expounded, uh, you know, interaction. Otherwise, we do thank you all for being a part of the show today. That is the 22nd edition of UBC Behind the Headlines. And definitely, it wouldn't have been perfect minus the input of the production team, um, uh, the production team, uh, the people on the cameras, uh, the sound, the lighting, and every other technicality as well as the nitty-gritties involved in the production of this particular show. Um, just to reintroduce or rather to re recap a little about these persons before we wave together and say goodbye uh, with of course the two uh, Margaret Muhanga and Ramadan Gobi on Zoom. Uh, Angela Kasekende is an aspirant for National Female Youth MP seat. Uh, while it's Nalugwa Gloria is the National President ISEC in Uganda with uh, Obia uh, Dennis, a uh, land valuer at Bidwells Uganda Limited, and of course uh, Mr. Jacob Eyeru, who happens to be the chairperson of National Youth Council. The usual suspects are those two that you see on your screens, that is on, uh, uh, well, from where I'm seated, it's, it's right, but I think from where you are, it's left. <laughs> the two on your screens are Honorable Margaret Muhanga, that is uh, the Member of Parliament for Burahia Constituency in Kabarole District, we hope she will actually be successful and return in the next term of office. Uh, thank you so very much for being a part of the show, as well as uh, uh, Ramadan Gobi, uh, that is in the midst of the screen, who happens to be a policy analyst, an economist, and a lecturer at Makere University. Before we all wave in, uh, in one accord, just to remind you that is watching us, wear your mask at all times where need be social distance and perhaps where there is so many people keep it two meters distance then wash your hands as regularly as possible with soap and water if that's not possible make use of an alcohol-based sanitizer otherwise to you charles odongtho whom i've actually represented this particular day or rather sat in for quick recovery to you and for you that is watching us all, probably the wide, the wide picture as well as the Zoom inclusion is coming so we can wave to our viewer 
and wish them a good night. Please wave and wish them a good night. See you next time. God bless you.